Splint Day, Holy Day. Now that happened at the beginning. At the same time, the Bible says that's the creation. The Bible says that there's a new creation now. And in the new creation is brought through Messiah. It's brought through Messiah on the cross and in the resurrection. That is the work of a new creation, a new birth, a new genesis, a new beginning. Now, since it's the same God and it's the same work of creation, of beginning, could there be a link between the two events, between the first creation and the new creation? The answer is yes. When did God finish the works of the creation? He did so on the sixth day. When did Messiah finish the work of the new creation, his labor? He did it on Friday. What is Friday? The sixth day. What was the day of the creation of man? The sixth day. What about the new creation of man? The sixth day. What is the day of the redemption of man? The sixth day. Same day that God created man. When does the crucifixion take place? Sixth day. And you look at the timing and look at the way the first day began. When did the first day begin? In a sense, it was Sunday, though it wasn't called Sunday. Yom Rishon in Hebrew, that first day at the beginning of Genesis. When did it begin? It began at night. The Bible says always that it was first night and then it was day, the opposite of the way we think in the West. In the Hebrew calendar, it always begins at night. Every holiday, as you know, begins when the sun goes down, the sun goes down, it is Erev, it is evening, the new day begins. That's why it's not just because of the Hebrew holidays. Every day on the calendar is like that. It's just you note it when the Hebrew holiday comes up that you only start at sundown. So the first day, it, it, the reason why that is, is because it's in Genesis that way. That first there was evening, and then there was morning. So every Hebrew day begins at sunset of the day before, and ends at sunset of the day after. So therefore, the sixth day is Friday, but when on the biblical calendar would the sixth day begin? Not Friday, but Thursday. It begins Thursday night. The sixth day begins at sundown on Thursday. Is that significant? Very. Because that's the exact time when, in a sense, the passion of Messiah begins. That sixth day begins Thursday night at sundown with what? With the beginning of the Passover Seder. It starts at sundown. It's the Last Supper. He's talking about his death. He is overseeing that meal that's all about his death. It's beginning on the day of man because he's going to die for the sins of man. And he's going to redeem man from the curse. So it all begins that way. You know, in the beginning, man, when he was created, was brought into a garden on the sixth day. On the sixth day of this new creation, Messiah is brought into the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, his death is prepared for. On the sixth day, he is crucified. The sixth day. And in Hebrew, you know, again, night and then day. It has to go from sunset Thursday to sunset Friday. So the work of the redemption has to end before the sun goes down on the sixth day. That's why it ended when it did. He's on the cross for how many hours? Six hours. The number of man for the sins of man, for the redemption of man. And then at the sixth hour, he cries out, it is finished, which is Friday afternoon. The sun is going down. And then it goes down and he is brought into the tomb and laid down. It's over. His works are over. And then comes what? Then comes the Shabbat, the Sabbath. What does he do on that seventh day? He rests. He rests in the tomb, just like God did at the beginning. God ceased from his works. He finished his works on the sixth day, rested on the seventh day. Messiah does the exact same thing. I mean, even in his death, he observes it all. You know, we look at the Sabbath, in the, the Orthodox and how they do it, and we see it only often as a burden, legalism, and that's often what it can become. But we tend to see it not really what it is. You know, the Sabbath is in its nature something beautiful. The Sabbath was made for man. You know, Sabbath is about shalom. It's about peace. It's about a peace that often many believers don't have. And I want you to open up to Hebrews 4 to put this together, Genesis and Hebrews 4. 
And Hebrews 4 speaks also about the Shabbat, the Sabbath. And here's what it says. Verse 4. Hebrews 4, verse 4. And I love Hebrews. I love the way this talks. For he has said somewhere, doesn't tell you where, somewhere concerning the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall never enter into my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter in, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of the disobedience, again, he fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as it's been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If Joshua had given them rest, he wouldn't have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Shabbat, a Sabbath for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Therefore, let us be diligent to do what? To enter the Sabbath, the Shabbat. What it's saying is there's a greater Sabbath yet to come. In a sense, the Sabbath was a foreshadow of the peace that God would bring because of Messiah. What does the Sabbath come from? It comes from Messiah. It is the Sabbath. It's no accident he died when he did. Already, all put in the tomb and then the Sabbath comes. He always observed the Sabbath when he was alive. Now he observes it in his death. The holiest day. He had to die when he did. His labor had to be over because you don't work on the Sabbath. He is, he said, the Son of Man is the Adon HaShabbat. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day, the state of being that represents the peace of God, the shalom of God, the state of completion and rest and blessing. That's what it's about. And Messiah is Lord over that. He is the Lord of Shalom. He's the Prince. It says he's the Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom in Hebrew. He's the Master of Shalom. Peace comes from him or it doesn't come. He is the Lord of completion, what it means. He's the Lord of being full, fulfilled, and right, and blessed. The Lord of rest. In Messiah, you are to enter that place, this divine Shabbat Sabbath of God. But how? In the book of Hebrews, it's written, let us enter, let us labor to enter. It may take some work to get in. We're going to see that so many believers live their lives in a state of restlessness, just like most of the world, and are not living in the Sabbath of God. But the secrets are there in Messiah's entrance. When Messiah died on the cross, he was not only dying on the cross, he was also entering the Sabbath in the greatest Sabbath entrance that has ever been after the, the days of Genesis. What was the cross? It was the way he entered into the Shabbat. He labored to enter in. And so the amazing cool thing is, when you look at Messiah on the cross, you actually find keys of entering the peace of God for your life. And keys of entering the place in God where you can have completion and healing and fullness. Messiah, Lord of the Sabbath, teaches us how to enter the Sabbath on the cross because that's what he's doing. Aside from everything else, he's also entering the Sabbath. And I'm, we're going to look at a few of those keys tonight. It's really cool because you wouldn't think so. That's exactly what's happening. On the cross, John 19, 28, he says, I am thirsty. I am thirsty, quoting from the Psalms. Is there any key there about peace with God with that? Yes, there is. One of the things, one of the keys of having peace with God and peace in your life is you have to bring your needs to God. Whatever that is, as much as you don't, you're in trouble. And you'll never be at peace. As much as you pretend you don't have a need, you will never have peace with God. You know, as much as you try to fulfill your own need, you will never have peace with God. As much as you keep two worlds apart, hey, you know, at home I'm one way, I'm here and I'm pretending everything's fine in my life, and yet I have a real need. If you don't bring that to God, you're not going to have peace. You have a need for people to accept you. Listen, we know that's not the end. We shouldn't be there at the end. But if you have the need, don't pretend you don't have it. Bring it to God. You know, whatever the need is, you're lonely. Bring it to God. You know, it may even be, you know, you're tempted. Bring it to God is what it's saying. 
You have to bring your thirst to him and you have to confess it if you're going to be touched, if you're going to have peace in your life. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened down, and I'll give you rest. And come to me, all you who are thirsty, come and drink. First thing is don't hide your need. People get into big trouble for doing that. And some of the great saints of God, I mean, David got into big trouble for keeping kind of two things in his life and pretending he didn't have that need. You know, God said, why don't you come to me? The thing is, whatever it is, even if you're, you're being tempted, that's a need. Bring it to God. God is never saying, don't bring it to me. I don't want to touch. He never says, I, don't, I won't deal with it. He'll deal with it. Bring it to God. And he's there. Next thing he says on the cross, another key to the Sabbath of God, of Messiah. Matthew 27, 45, he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He speaks Aramaic, quoting from the Psalms in Aramaic. Eli, Eli, my God, my God, lama, why? Sabachthani, have you forsaken me? Now people argue and say, how could he be God if he's saying, my God, you've forsaken me? That's the awesome, awesome thing about the cross. It's God actually separating himself from himself so he could be one with us who are separated from God. And yet it's all that, and it's also part of the Sabbath entrance. I mean, you wouldn't expect a leader to say this publicly, and here of all people, Messiah, to say this, to say something like that, saying that God has separated, has forsaken him, and he's saying, why? But another next key related to the first, for you to have peace in, with God, peace in your life, is that come as you are. Bring everything, even the sin in your life, especially the sin, God wants it. The guilt, especially the guilt. I mean, he took all these things on the cross, and he already took your sin, so if you're holding on to your sin, you're a thief, because it belongs to him. You know, no matter what it is, maybe you think that God promised you something that didn't happen in your life and you've been dealing with this and it's been separating you from God until you get this out with God you're not gonna have peace even the separation from God don't let that even listen if God himself is saying God why are you far from me if God could separate from himself and still be God that means that no matter how far you feel from God you will there's a way doesn't matter what it is even that won't separate you from God you could have committed murder and that still won't separate you from God if you bring it to God. It's just you don't feel him close. Bring it to him. You're mad at God. You ever been mad at God? Yes, of course you've been mad with God sometimes. The key is we know the end of the story is that God wins the argument. But the thing is, if you don't ever argue with him, he'll never win in your life. You understand? Jacob wrestled with God. And you have to, you're mad with God, bring it to God. It's okay. It's not going to shock him. Other people in the Bible were mad with him, about him. David was. Others were. You know, the thing is that God is used to that. But you've got to bring it to God. And at times you might even say, listen, I don't feel like... I remember a time when we were waiting, hoping for a particular building that fell through early on. And we had no other building. And I remember... That, that day when it fell through after a year, I was just, I said, God, I'm just not happy with you today. And I don't feel like talking to you today. But I was telling him that I didn't feel like talking to him. It was okay if you don't feel like talking to him as long as you tell him about it. What happened was, God then did the biggest miracle the next day he got us the, the building. But I had to get to that point if I just didn't, you know, didn't deal with it, it not it. Lama, he says, why God? Which means we don't have to understand everything, but still bring it to him. Why, God? I don't understand, but I don't have to understand everything, but this is what I'm feeling. Come as you are. No matter how distant you are from God, he's there with you also knowing what it is to be distant from God. Even in that. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Even then, my God, you're still my God, even though I don't understand what you're doing. Messiah's word on the cross. One of the things he says on the cross in John 19, 28. Woman, behold your son. Behold, man, behold your mother. What's this about? Some people say in the Catholic Church, there are those, well, that means Mary's your mother. Well, then it would mean that John's our son, but that doesn't go. You know, he's saying something because he's leaving the world. He's going to be gone. How do you enter the Shabbat of God? He's tying up the loose ends. 
why you may not have peace is there are loose ends in your life that you never tied up. And you never tied it up with God. Maybe unfinished business you never did. Maybe something with your parents. Maybe something with another. What, maybe you, you wronged somebody and you never asked forgiveness. You never made it right. Well, part of entering the Sabbath is this. He's finishing up. Do you know, you can relate to this. You're going on vacation and it takes you like days to finish up in order to go on vacation. And it takes a lot of work to go on vacation. You know, there are times I remember, this, this just, it's, I don't know if the vacation was worth it, how much it took to get to that vacation and finish up. But if I didn't finish it up, I could never go. If you want to enter God's rest, then you, if there's unfinished business, you need to bring it to God and finish it up. You know, Zacchaeus, when he was saved, he didn't say, okay, I'm saved, so forget about everybody else. He said, okay, I'm going to go back to everybody, and I'm going to give them four times as much as I ripped them off for. He was tying it up. This was a man who, who undoubtedly had peace. You ever leave home and you, and you think, you think, wait, there's something I left on or I left, there's something there. Something not, I left the light on. I left the oven on. I left the mixer. I left the machine on. I left the lawnmower on. And there's something there and you don't have peace because there's something unfinished. Maybe right now you have something at home and you have no peace. You can't have rest and peace until you can say goodbye, finish it up, wrap it up. If there's something in your life, wrap it up. Something gnawing on you, wrap it up. Some guilt, some shame, wrap it up with God. It's His. Messiah on the cross in Luke 23, 34, He said the most awesome words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here He is bleeding to death. They're killing Him wrongly. Hating him, mocking him, degrading him, despising him. And what does he do? He asked for forgiveness for them. He's forgiving them. He didn't die with any grudges. He has forgiveness on those who are crucifying him and making him bleed to death and, and mocking him as he does. But what's he doing? He's entering the Shabbat which teaches us something very important. How do you find peace in your life? You are not going to have peace if you don't forgive. You must forgive for your own sake, for their sake, for your sake. And some of you, and in the Lord, you still hold grudges, and as much as you do, you don't enter the kingdom, you don't enter the peace of God. You have grudges, you have, you're frustrated all the time, you're angry all the time, you are defrauding yourself of the peace of God. You're never going to have it. Until you let go of it, the unforgiveness the ministry, or you can have just no. the uh, Mysteries Volume 13, yeah. which is those nine DVD set for a donation of $55 Th this is to the ministry. probably the, one of the most amazing offers of video and audio and r the, the things that uh, uh, are written as well, his books. So order that right now. We'll be right back after this special message, and we're going to talk about the mystery of the ghost kingdom. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this special message. When you need a portable emergency power system that is ready at a moment's notice, the fuelless generator is exactly what you're looking for. If I thought an EMP bomb was coming, or if I thought there was going to be a big storm or a big problem, I would want one of these in my house. Something is going to happen in 2015 that is going to change how we view our, our system, how we view life. And when that something happens, you're not going to be able to get a fuelless generator. It's going to be impossible to get a generator. I'm really enthralled with this device. It's, it's, a tech, it's an elegant technology. With every storm we've had this winter, I just pull the thing out, I set it up in the living room, I run some extension cords into other rooms. Uh, I even ran my 60-inch television off it. Call 1-888-988-1588 or write to Jim at P.O. Box 7330, Branson, Missouri, 65615. It's an, such an incredible offer. For example, this is for a donation of $2,500 to the ministry. And the unit just by itself is a retail value of $2,500, but you're also going to get a solar panel, which is a retail of $500, then the 20-foot extension cord, and that retails for, for over $50, and then the crane, which is a retail of over $200. So it's an absolutely incredible savings. 
a lot of people ask me to endorse stuff and all that. This is the only thing I have been endorsing like this. I fully believe in this product. Wow. But can you imagine in the pitch darkness that you have light? You can also go to the website, jimbakershow.com. Thank you for your continued support that helps keep us broadcasting around the world. Yes. Rabbi, one of the messages in your new series, the mystery volume 13, is the mystery of the ghost kingdom. That really intrigues me also. You have some real mysteries here. <laughs> Sound like Hardy Boy books to me, you know. Mm -hmm. So the mystery of the ghost kingdom. Yeah. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, uh, th this is linked to Daniel. Let me let me let me start this way. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, there was a movie called "It's a Mad, 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 Mad World." Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it was very funny. I saw that yeah. one when I was At a kid. At one point, they're they're looking for this treasure. Some of you, and they're looking for, it, and they say it's under the big W. And they're walking around this park looking for it. They're going all around, and right there, it's in front. But it's so big, they don't see it. I mean, it's right there in their faces, <laughs> but they don't see it. Well, this is a prophetic, I want to share a prophetic end time mystery that is like that big W. In other words, it is so big and we have, it's right there and we, for the most part, have not seen it. This is going to be a kind of a whole new take on Woo. it. And I'm beginning with Daniel, Daniel 2. Daniel sees the statue of the kingdoms that represent the four great empires of the world. The last one being the fourth one is the, is the Roman, it's the final form. It, it's going to be the end time kingdom as well. So he sees all that there. Now this is what he says about that fourth kingdom. Daniel 2 says this, verse 33, His legs were of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Part, so, he, so the Roman Empire or the, is the, represented by the legs and then the feet. And then verse 40 says this, The fourth kingdom shall be as iron, as iron breaks in pieces and subdues everything, all things. As iron breaks all these things, it will break in pieces and bruise. And where you saw the feet and the toes, part of the potter's clay and part iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, as much as so the iron mixed with the clay, and as the toes of the feet were part iron, part clay, the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And where you saw iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. All right. Rome. The traditional view of prophecy is this. Rome was the ancient kingdom. It fell in ancient times, long gone. We're waiting for when it will reappear. Now, there is tr that is true. That, that is true. Much can be said, but there's a whole other realm of this that is true that I believe we've missed. In fact, the fourth empire is already here. And let me, let me share. And let me share this. Here's the key. First key is the, the, the legs are divided. It's a divided, the, and then the toes, it says it's a divided kingdom, divided empire. And so it is divided in, in clay, iron, divided with the legs, divided there. It's an empire of division or duality. Two things, Rome, iron and clay. Rome was made up of the Romans, was also made up of peoples from all nations. Rome was divided literally into east and west. It became the eastern empire and the western empire. Now, Rome was also, is also divided in time. It stood then in ancient times. It will stand again in the end times solidified. So it's a divided essence is what we see here. What if the fourth empire, Rome, didn't end, still exists in a different form? It will exist in a, soli a solid form at the end. But what if iron breaks into pieces, but clay, it says, is broken? So it breaks, but it also it breaks other things, but it also gets broken. And by doing that, it subdues the world. What, it, what is that? There are different ways of subduing the world. What if the Roman Empire, by actually breaking, has been part of subduing the world? Rome is gone, or is it? The picture we have is Rome falling in 476 B, B, uh, AD. Uh -huh. The German, Germanic tribes come in, wipe it out. But the, what people don't know, by that time, Rome was already made up, the army was already made up of Germanic tribes of Rome. Not, though, much did not change when that happened. In fact, they even have a hard time making a real date of if it ended. It actually, the barbarians, who we say took over, continued to recognize the Roman Empire and said they are under the Roman Empire. Medieval civilization, Middle Ages, feudalism, was actually a carryover of Rome. It was just Rome breaking apart. It was the same mm -hmm. thing. The, la the language of Europe then was Latin, which is the language of the Roman Empire. It did not stop. 800 AD, Charlemagne is crowned emperor of the Romans. The holy. This is long after Rome was supposed to be gone. 
is crowned the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Rome will remain the center of civilization for, for over a thousand years. Most of us learned in school about what we call the Renaissance. What's the Renaissance? The Renaissance is the rebirth of what? It's the rebirth of Roman culture. It was all about Rome culture infusing everything. Nine, the year 951 AD, the Pope, the Pope crowns the German emperor or conqueror Otto as king of what? The Germany? No, of the Romans. He's one of, one of those, it starts the, whole, the, the Holy Roman Empire. We've heard about the Holy Roman Empire. This, this is a continuation of Rome. It's happening. And one of those Roman, Holy Roman Empires is called Charles V. One of his little piece of land was part of America. Now America, under this, this emperor of Rome. Now, one, the, what, this is the fourth beast. But this is, it, ha, it goes much farther. What's happening is that Rome actually did not end. I mean, in one sense, one sense, it spread through the world. It's been spreading through the world. Wow. It's been leavening the world. You can travel the, cap the world and look at capitals of the world, and all over you'll find their buildings are made to represent Rome all over the world. Roman law is the basis of much of law that we still get, is still all over the world. When the, the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor fell, or the, the, the empire fell, out of it was born Germany. The, the leader of Germany was called what? The Kaiser. What is Kaiser? It's Caesar. It means Caesar. Oh. Kaiser is simply the German way of saying Caesar. So here you have the Holy Roman Empire, then you have that. 20th century. The century of fascism, totalitarianism. Where does that begin? Begins with Mussolini. What was he trying to do? What was it? It was the revival of Rome. Hitler followed it for Nazi Germany. Where do you get the word fascism from? The Reign, they, they ruled as what? What's their title? Pontifus Maximus. What's that title? That was the title of the Caesar of Rome. The Emperor of Rome was the Pontifus Maximus. They took that from the same leader of Rome. They, the diocese, that's how Rome divided up Rome into diocese. Well, the, through the Catholic Church, it divided up, the world has been divided up as the Roman Empire. I'm not saying people in the Catholic Church know this or, or, or that's the point, but this is all the same, the continuation of the same thing. What language? Latin. The, from Rome comes the idea of the global state. You know, the fourth kingdom, you know, actually from the pieces of the fourth kingdom, which are, became France, Spain, England, and others, they colonized the entire world. The entire world, you, in other words, Rome broke up into France, England, all, and they each became an empire that subdued the entire world. I mean, you know, you have, you have the Spanish Empire, the French Empire, the British Empire. The British Empire, just one little piece of Rome, subdued one-fourth of the entire world. Some say one-third of the world. In other words, Rome has already been spreading and has been subduing culture, has been changing culture. One of the colonies from that little fragment of Rome is America. Colony, which that word, even the word comes from Rome. It, and, you know, our build, you go to, go to Washington, D.C., and you'll see, look at the buildings there. The Capitol building is modeled yeah. after the Roman pantheon. The pantheon means the, the temple of all gods. That is our Capitol building. What does it rest on? Rests on Cap Capitol Hill. What's that from? That's from Capitoline Hill, named after the Roman Hill. You know, you can look at the Supreme Court building, same thing. It is the Roman thing. Even the word, the, the, what's our, our highest body of ruling? The Senate. Where's that from? Rome. The president, the word president comes from Rome. You know, all, the language of Rome, Latin, has, in one form or another, has covered the world. If you speak Spanish, that's basically Latin, just morphed. It morphed into Spanish. You speak French, it's Latin, morphed into, morphed into French. You speak, you speak Portuguese, more, it's Latin. It's the Roman language, morphed into that. Romanian, same thing, all that. English, we say English. You know, English, what is English? English is Latin mixed in with German. In other words, it's Rome and the barbarians come together. It's the iron and the clay. Mixed and so, together. I, mixed together, iron oh and the clay, and it's covered the world. The language of Rome. When did Rome fall? We said, we said 476 AD. Not exactly. Rome split into two, just like the legs of the statue of Daniel. 
and the east and west. Well, the Western Empire, we said... Sao cơn mưa đêm em đã làm gì giờ Khó thuốc lăn lần đi giờ Anh chỉ muốn một đêm này không Ngày ai yêu mơ nữa gì Yeah, yeah, em muốn là quê và xa mơ Em đã còn đi nhưng mà ba mùi Anh không thể giữ em được biên mình Và những người xó được người ghen tình Và những người mấy em đã quên rồi Quan là con má nằm bên tôi Giờ chỉ con má nằm bóng trôi Anh chẳng thể giữ được cho em Còn cơn mưa cứ đang nhật trôi và em xa rồi Chỉ còn anh đêm nơi cái mây mờ thôi yeah. Mắt anh đã mở đi mascara Môi hồng như em Grasada yeah. Bạn em như có AK Phá hoa là ta 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 Anh bay lên trên trời cao Thôi ngăn đào chứ mà vì sao Mọi thứ còn anh yeah, yeah. Chỉ cần như anh mở bao 